Amen. It is an honor to share God's word today with the entire family, and I'm usually preaching in the Spanish service, but sometimes as one of the teaching pastors, I'm here, and I'm just so thrilled to be here with you today. This has been an awesome sermon series as we have examined the Lord's Prayer phrase by phrase. It has been refreshing to know that we can come into God's presence and be confident that He really hears our prayers. Prayer really changes things, not only individually but collectively as well. We have learned during this sermon series on the Lord's Prayer that prayer is about remembering our Father in heaven. He is supreme, He is powerful, and He is majestic. We have also learned that it is about praising His name as we confess, Hallowed be your name. He's not a God. He is the only Almighty God. How many say amen to that? It is about exalting and honoring the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Prayer is also about ruling when we confess, let your kingdom come. It is about asking God to rule over every aspect of our lives every single day. Prayer is about submission and dependence on God and on his will. When we pray, your will be done. I remember I learned a simple prayer a few years ago that says the following. Your will, Lord, nothing else, nothing less, but your will in my life. It is simple, yet it is very profound. Prayer is also about requesting and trusting in God to sustain us, to provide for all of our needs as we pray, give us today our daily bread. He is our provider. We could depend completely on him as we trust in him with a childlike faith. Last week, we saw how praying is also releasing as we pray, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. There is power in confessing sins to God, but also there is power to release the power of forgiveness to other people. What a beautiful picture of God's love. Today, we find ourselves in the last phrase of this prayer, and I believe this phrase talks to us about relying on God as we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There is also a footnote in your Bibles that adds, for years is the kingdom and the power and the glory, amen. Although I believe it was added as a doxology after in the times, I think it's totally biblical as well. But what does it mean, the phrase, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil? We have prayed for his forgiveness of sin, and because sin is part of our lives, but we can confess those. And here we address another need that arises daily. We seek help in our battle with sin and temptation. The first word in our phrase is and, and this ties this verse with the phrases before for the request for food, forgiveness, and the grace to extend forgiveness. So this verse is about trusting God in the greatest battles we face in life, in the battle we face every day with temptations and flesh and the attacks of the enemy. It is simply a request for protection. So as we learn to rely on him, we find the secret of our victory. Let's look today at the problem of temptation, the reality of evil, and the promise of victory. The problem of temptation. Our Lord Jesus instructed us to pray and lead us not into temptation. This uh, statement presupposes the leadership of our Lord in our lives. And let us remember that the Lord's Prayer is given within the context of the Sermon of the Mount, addressed to his disciples, and therefore to us today. Our Heavenly Father is in control of everything. Since this is true, does this also mean that God is leading us to places where we can sin? The answer to that question is a resounding no. God cannot do that. However, God allows periods of trials in our lives in which we are tested. Let me break you the news. 
If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are tested, you will be tested until you die. Many of you have been believers for 20, 30, 40 years and you thought you won't be tested, but you are still. The Apostle James addresses this problem in James chapter 1, verses 13 and on, and we're going to be there for a period of time. This is what the Word of God says. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. The word translated temptation in Matthew 6, 13 can also mean trial or testing. James makes it clear that can, God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. The father never tempts his children to do evil. However, he does test our faith because, pay attention to this, a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. A faith that cannot be tested cannot and will not be trusted. As God's children, we benefit from our trials as we deepen our roots in God's word. Temptation is often associated with a negative connotation, but temptation can help us grow spiritually. God never leads us into direct contact with sin, but every trial we face comes with the potential for us to fail. We might seem but when we do, the fall lies on us and not on God. So what is the Lord telling us to pray? This petition probably says, Lord, please do not lead us into a trial which will present a temptation stronger than our own power to resist it. Let me read it again because I wrote it, okay? Hashtag Rolando Aguirre. Lord, please do not lead us into a trial which will present a temptation stronger than our own power or ability to resist it. Since this is true, then where does temptation come from? Again, James gives us a clear picture here. Verses 14 and 15. It says, but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. It is a problem of the heart. The word lured is translated seduce. And the term evil desire is sometimes translated lust. But the word is epitumia which means an over-desire. Sin is an over-desire. The word epicene is described as adultery, the desire for another love, not precisely God's love. So anything that displaces God from our hearts is adultery. And you have heard, it's also idolatry. If we desire more the things of this world than the things of God, we will be easily enticed. Our flesh is hopelessly given over to sin. So when temptation comes our way, it is not the devil's fault, it is not the Lord's fault, it is not the world's fault, it is not the government, it is not the convention, it is not the church, it is not my wife, it is not my children, it is my fault. We have a human tendency to sin. So when we pray, forgive us our debts, we are looking back to the past. When we pray, give us today our daily bread, we are looking to the present. But when we are praying, lead us not into temptation, we are looking to the future. We are asking God to protect us, so we are not guided by our own human desires, but instead, we are guided by his Holy Spirit and his word. So the essence of this prayer is for protection from the sins of the flesh. Because the flesh cannot be less fleshy. You cannot get up in the morning and say, flesh, you are less fleshy today. No. We are in a sinful world and body. So as we walk, we want to honor God. 
As we walk, we want to be good citizens of the kingdom. As we walk, we want to be a blessing to others. And to do that, my friends, we must walk in God's will. Nothing else, nothing less but your will in my life, Lord. I'm getting excited now. Therefore, no man or woman should face the future without a clear past. You know, friends, when sin has been dealt with, the clean soul has a deep fear of falling again. And we understand that it is only by grace that we can be forgiven. We carry a sinful flesh with us every single minute we live. The Apostle Paul told us about that in Romans chapter 7. We want to do good, but we can't, and we do this thing. We, we have found ourselves in that situation not only one time, several times. We need help. We need help. We need a savior. We need the one who can strengthen us in times of temptation. We need the supernatural strength because we are fighting a supernatural battle against flesh, the world, and the enemy. Jesus went through all of our temptations. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18 says, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. So when we are praying, lead us not into temptation, we are saying, Lord, give me the faith. I need to accept this trial and to use it for your glory. Deepen my roots, increase my faith, and help me to turn this testing into triumph and not into temptation. Anti writes, Anti Wright says, to say lead us not into temptation doesn't, of course, mean that God himself causes people to be tempted. Instead, he says, when we hear this, what it really means is, Lord, enable us to pass safely through the testing of our faith. Do you want to pass the test? I want to pass the test. Many in the scriptures were tested. F Father Abraham was tested. Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joseph, Esther, and the list goes on and on. Job, <laughs> our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are not excluded from temptation. The key is the following. How we respond to trials will determine whether or not they test us or tempt us, build us up or bring us down. The process of temptation is always the same one. It is always the same tactic from the book of Genesis. It has been always the same. It is the process of sin and temptation. It starts with seduction and enticement. Then it goes to conception in your mind and in your heart. And then it produces the birth of sin that evidently and eventually takes us to death, which means separation in the scriptures. I always bring illustrations. Let's suppose this chocolate bar is the temptation. How many of you have been there? Say amen. Okay. I got it for the pantry last night and I planned it all. And I say I'm going to use it as an illustration. Because the enticement, the seduction comes. You look at the wrap and you say, this one is good. It's with pecans and caramel. Oof, awesome. The doctor said, I'm not supposed to eat it because that's going to be bad for my health. But, but he wants to see me skinny all the time. I don't know what he's thinking about. So you start... You start dancing with the devil. That's, some theologians say that temptation is like dancing with the devil. You start dancing and then you start dancing until you conceive that in your mind. You say, I'm going to take it to church tomorrow. I'm going to put it in my jacket so I don't forget it. I'm going to take it out. It has conceived. The question is not when, but how. How am I going to do it? Well, I'm going to do it in the first service, the second service, and the third service. And now you open the rat. Ooh. You go to the birth of sin. You open it. Mm. You smell it. Ooh. 
and then you take a bite. Oh, it's good. It's good. I cannot share with you coronavirus <laughs> season. I can't do that. But it's good. Now, now I feel bad. Now I feel like I should have not done it. Why did I do it? I brought it. Oh my goodness, why did I have it? Then the answer is not simply say, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, the question is our heart. You have to develop a deeper desire, an over-desire, an epi, like epidemic, epi, an over-desire to trust, to get in love, to be passionate about Christ, so I don't fall into temptation. The question is not if you're going to fall into temptation, you will. The question is, are you developing a greater desire? So there is a reality of evil as well. We live in a supernatural world, and there is a spiritual warfare. Satan roams throughout the earth opposing to God's work and tempting God's people to disobey. So this verse closes with the words deliver us from evil, but it carries the idea of deliver us from the evil one. It's a specific. It talks about an enemy. You see, every Christian has an enemy who hates him or her and wants nothing more than to see us fall and fail. He's a deceiver and a liar. The only goal of this enemy is to use you to bring disgrace and dishonor to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. So the enemy is the devil and he desires to see you fail. Oftentimes we say things like the devil really knows what to put in front of me. The truth is, it's not much the devil that is the problem. It is me. We are only tempted by the things that our own human nature desires. We are enticed. And the word enticed comes from the word that means to bait. So when we are tempted, the old man is baiting the new man to go back to the old way of life so that we are falling into sin again and again. We fight the devil schemes. The enemy usually uses the same strategy. The Greek word is methodia, which means methods, strategies, to communicate that he's a, a, a person that is like working constantly. Therefore, we cannot underestimate or overestimate the devil. He's constantly at work. This is why the Bible says in Ephesians, we just read it, 6, 11, and 12. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers or this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. God equips us and enables us if we trust him. Tim Keller offers a helpful guide when he says that you must make a distinction between the cause and the occasion for sin. So he says, don't make the mistake of confusing them. He offers this illustration. For example, you take an algebra test and you failed the test because you didn't study or didn't know the material. How many young people say amen? Don't say amen. You could be really upset and say, well, if that teacher hadn't given me this test, I would not have failed the test. <laughs> of course, it's not the teacher's fault. The test was the occasion for the failure, but not the cause of it. Temptation works in a similar way. You and I have a free will. You only and always will do what you most desire to do. Don't mistake the occasion for the cause. You can ever say that you wanted to do what was right, but then you have to do the wrong thing to do the right thing. That's not the way that it works. That's a lie. Our enemy is spiritual in nature, and he must be bottled spiritually as well. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. 
We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. We have a divine power to destroy strongholds in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. So obedience is key to overcome evil. Third, the promise of victory. The power of temptation has no more force in our lives than we allow it to have it. If we want to stand against it, we can. Our Lord has given us some precious promises to serve, to strengthen us during temptations. He promises us the victory over all of our temptations. There is a truth here. Temptation might be powerful, but it is not more powerful than our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us victory when we trust in him. We do not have to fall into the trap of temptation. The phrase is a plea for God's help in the battle with this enemy. When we pray this prayer, we recognize the fact that we are unable, that we have no ability to resist temptation, to wage this war on our own. So what do we do? We call on the name of the Lord, employing his power to stand against the devil in the battle with temptation and sin. As disciples of Jesus, we have every right to pray against the devil and we might ask God to deliver us from the evil one. Satan and his army are too strong for us, but not for God. Jesus commands us to pray for deliverance. He himself prayed. I call this the Lord's Prayer as well. And we find that in John chapter 17, verse 15, he prayed. He says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world. He's talking about believers, his disciples. But that you keep them. And there is the original word says, protect them from the evil one. So Jesus pray for us. Jesus pray for me, for my victory. He prayed so I could be delivered from the evil one. He intercedes for us. He is with us today. We don't fight for victory, but from victory. The victory Christ won for us on the cross. The enemy is already at work in the lives of unbelievers and disobedient believers. If we are obedient disciples, he will try to attack our prayer life and our Bible study time. <laughs> How many have been there in that boat? Because he knows this, that when we pray and we know the scriptures, all will be dangerous to him. The Lord's Prayer is a declaration of word to Satan. He doesn't like us to pray to our Father in heaven. He doesn't like us to glorify his name. He doesn't like us to, to let God reign in our hearts and in our minds. He doesn't like us to ask God for our daily provision. He doesn't like us to ask God to protect us from him because he knows he has been defeated. So when you feel tempted, I, I'm practical. I, I grew up in church and sometimes I don't remember the sermon, so... When I became a preacher, I preached for the first time at 14 years old, and I'm a PK. I offer always practical application here. Here's what you take home. Praise his name. When you feel tempted, Lord, I praise you even though I don't understand all my circumstances. I praise you even though I feel tempted. I praise you even though I fail you today. I praise your name. Hallowed be your name. Second, trust his power. Lord, I trust in your power. You can deliver me from all these things. I trust in your character, in your providence, in your power over my sickness, over my relationships, over my business, over my ministry, over my circumstances. You are powerful. I trust in your power. Third, proclaim his word. Oh, our Lord Jesus, when tempted, he said, it is written to fight the enemy. He said, it is written Man is not to live on bread only. Man is to live by every word that God speaks. He said to Satan again, it is written, you must not tempt the Lord your God. He, Jesus said to Satan one last time, get away Satan. It is written, you must worship the Lord your God. You must only obey him. Satan cannot resist God's word. <laughs> you know what? He's allergic to it. The more you and I, quote scriptures 
Oh, he wouldn't like to mess with us. That's why, as believers, we should memorize and cite the scriptures during our constant battles. Fourth, fight in community. That's why it's important to see these baptisms. Oh, I'm so blessed to see the baptisms. When someone comes and they say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, my life will be committed to the Lord. Oh my goodness, that's awesome. We, we fight in community. We celebrate in community. We see transformation in community. We gather to worship the name of the Lord in community because God is working in and through us. You don't fight alone. You fight in community. Lastly, Wait on his promises. Oh, God's promises are always faithful. What are some of those promises? I thought about just reading a few. Just let them sink for a moment. Isaiah 43, 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, they shall not, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to men. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you might be able to endure it. Second Peter 2, 9a says, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. Friends, we need to appropriate to the resources we have been given in the person of the Holy Spirit and the power of the word of God. We are to dress up in the whole armor of God and take our stand. By the way, the phrase, having done all to stand, has the idea of fighting to a standstill. We are to take our stand against the flesh and the devil. And when we have fought to a standstill, that means when we have exhausted all of our strength in the, in the battle, when we are frustrated, when we are about to give up, we find that our Savior is right next to us and he's fighting for us and he's with us. And he gives us victory over temptation. So don't give up. The Savior is with us. He is with us. After all, he is ever near to us. He is our helper. That's how we fight our battles. Brothers and sisters, victory is ours in the battle with temptation. We are challenged to pray about our need in this battle. And we are to trust the Lord to deliver us from the hour of trial temptation. He will do his part. Do you need help in the battle with temptation? All of us do. All of us do. This is a prayer of victory and proclamation. So now, with all the understanding of this prayer, we can pray, Lord, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Be blessed, church.